Welcome. I'm here with the directors of two of the best films of 2020, Another Round and On the Rocks, Thomas Vinterberg, who's somewhere very wintry, and Sofia Coppola, who's somewhere that's not very wintry. But I guess the first question I'll throw out to both of you guys to get this thing going is, I can't think of two filmmakers who made more films about the relationships between parents and children. I mean, Thomas, I can also hear a baby crying. When I hear a baby cry, I think of your movies, because it's often an infant crying in your films. And I want you guys to talk about that, why these familial connections are so important to you as storytellers. And I'll start with you, Thomas. Well, well, I, I grew up in a very unusual family. Uh, I grew up in a hippie commune, a uh, big house full of people uh, amongst intellectuals and genitals and, and a very free spirited life. Uh, and sort of the communal life and, and the element of togetherness and group thing has always been uh, at the center of what I've been doing. And therefore diving into family life has been, you know, uh, up front for me uh, a couple of times, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my parents, they, they moved into this house with some other people and, and broke down family structures and felt very sexy doing it. And a lot of things that I've been doing since that has been a mirror of that somehow, you know, when I did Dogma 95 back, back in the days, many, many years ago, it was, it was the same thing. We jumped off a cliff and tried something that we didn't feel what was tried before. And, and we felt very sexy doing it because we, because we did, because we did it together, I guess. And, uh, and there was an element of risk to it and an element of exploration and, and stuff. Uh, so doing things together and doing something dangerous together, uh, or at least explorative to some extent, um, I guess it creates the ultimate sense of solidarity. And I've always been fascinated by that. Sophia? I think Festoon has to be the, the best movie ever made about family. It's such a classic. But, um, Thank but you. I, well. But yeah, I think, I, I don't know. I just, we're also impacted by how we grew up in our family that, um, and I guess as a director, you're trying, I guess like people do in therapy, it's our way of trying to understand ourselves and where we came from and, and look at uh, the world around us and, um, and the things that impacted us. So it seems like, like writers, so many people are drawn to that subject and how to do it in a way that doesn't feel self-indulgent, but that you're still doing something that's personal to you. No, I, I asked that question just because so often, especially, you know, in this country, Sophia, when people make films about family, they're family films. Um, they're not about sort of exploring those tensions that can come between generations and, 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 and how people respond to that. And I think actually there's something really kind of brave about the way you both work in that way in that it's about how generations kind of can come to understand each other, whereas so often in family movies about intergenerational stuff, there's about this divide. Um, I think that's something you both are really interested, in, or rather, that comes out in the movies quite a bit. Oh, thank you. I I think it's always, I mean, it's always interesting what's not being said and what's, um, yeah, you know, the tensions that you, uh, and then find out kind of where it's coming from. But I'm always interested in what's, yeah, you know, what's under the surface. I think. Yeah. Well, when when I watch uh, Sophia's films, I'm amazed with how honest they appear. And often, of course, in, in a father relationship kind of setting, but there's, there's an element of honesty in this. And uh, there's a huge um, element of courageousness in the way you stretch time. You let things evolve. You've done that from, from the beginning. You've, it, it was something we explored, you know, me and my teachers back in the days when we started uh, with Lost in Translation, it was like, okay, she's, she's having, she's inventing this, this sort of little thing amongst two people and she dwells on it and it becomes enormously rich and interesting and it creates uh, a sense of honesty, which is, which is rare, which I very much enjoy and also very much in, in, your, new, in your new movie. I was super impressed by that. Thank you. That's so nice to hear. Thank you. I love um, Another Round so much. I was so happy to see it and um 
and we were talking for days. My cousins and I watched it together, and all for days we we're like, okay, well, we had to, we're at like point two. We need to be at point five. <laughs> we were, <okay. laughs> so, um, but it was something I never never saw before. Nobody talked really talks about, and I just wonder where where the idea. What was what was the starting point for for this film for you? Well, the starting point was looking at world history, really, um, seeing how many great accomplishments having been done by drunk people, <laughs> uh, basically. And I, I, I wanted to make a celebration of alcohol solely. But, but then, it, of course, it, it grew from there. Uh, and we couldn't really find the engine for the story. And we very quickly realized that what was even more fascinating is that this, this liquor, socially accepted liquor that can elevate situations, elevate people, make great world leaders, make great decisions, also kills people and destroys families and whole societies. And we thought if we want to make a more honest movie, we would have to make a movie about both and then we got even more ambitious. Um, I guess we ended up wanting to make a life affirming film about being inspired. My, my wife, who is more clever than I am, um, tells me that it's a film about the uncontrollable. Whereas we, if we, we live in a life which is more and more measured. Like I, our iPhones measure how many steps we take. Every time we talk to a journalist, we know they're going to have a number of clicks put in their screen on their articles for how many people have clicked. We, we appear on social media every day. We get thumbs up or thumbs down. We're graded and measured. And there's not much room for the uncontrollable. And then I asked her, what is the uncontrollable? And she says, well, the best example is falling in love. It's, you fall and you lose control. And you meet something that you cannot buy, prepare, measure, but something grand. To some extent, our movie is trying to be about that. When you put the bottle to your lips, you open that door into something inspired, hopefully. You know, th that was our ambition. To... But then, uh, tragically, my daughter died uh, and changed the whole changed everything in my life and and this ambition of making something grander than just an alcohol movie became a circumstance something we had to do to continue uh and we continue to honor her so it had to be a life-affirming film so it's kind of a it's it's the kind of movie that started here and then became uh something else was she involved in the beginning of when you were working on the story? Um, she was in the movie. She was supposed to be in the movie. Uh, she was 19 um, and she was one of the students. Oh. And, and she read the script two months prior to her death. And she was, she, she was brutally honest to me, always. Like if I would wear a collared shirt, she would say panic age and leave the room. And, and so she was very uh, upfront with me. And, but when she read this, the script for another round, she sent me an, um, like a love declarance. She, she, she was like um, totally 100% in love with this project and felt seen by it somehow. And uh, that's one of the only reasons we, we could continue. Of course. And oh. you know, if, if people laugh at the movie, I guess it's because they tried really hard to make me laugh, those actors <laughs> at this time, so. Um, oh yeah, Matt, Mads is, uh, I've, always I've always loved his work, but um, yeah, I, I love him in the film. And, and, and how, how long have you guys known each other and worked together? And, were you thinking of him when you wrote the story? I, I, I try to write my screenplays for specific actors, which I suppose you do as well. Yeah, it helps, I think. <laughs> well, if it's inspiring because it's, it's, you're writing it for them and you, you can imagine being with that, those actors that you love. And exactly. What I think it helps a lot for me. Yeah, I've always done that. The problem is they've gotten rich and famous and they've gotten agents and stuff. And <laughs> And, and suddenly they have to read the script to sort of, you know, agree to participate. 
and then you've worked for years with them in your mind. And it's, uh, I don't know if you've <laughs> been in that situation, Sophia. No, I feel the same way. It's nerve wracking, but I, I figure if nothing else, at least they inspired the script and you wouldn't have written it without them. And, and I was very grateful when Bill showed up to do our film because um, yeah, you, you're, you've, you've lived with them in your mind for so long. I just, is that a, work, a concern for you guys when you're crafting something? for specific actors that you have relationships with? Like Mads, you, uh, I guess for, for Mads, you, you may be the only person who's cast him as a teacher twice, Thomas. Nobody's ever done that before. And uh, for you, Sophia, Bill, when you're building these things, is there some part of you that thinks, what if I don't get him? Oh, totally. Yeah. But with, with, with this one, with, the sec with, with another round, there wasn't any doubts because he was so in love with the project before there wasn't even really a project. But when we did The Hunt, I didn't know him that well. So I, I wrote the film for Al Pacino because I know I, him I cannot get. Uh, and, and, or actually it was, sorry, it was Robert De Niro in, in the guy as he played it, the deer hunter. So that's who I had in mind because I didn't- Is that why there's a scene with the deer, is the shooting scene? Is that, from the, is that your deer hunter tribute? Well, I guess the whole film is a deer hunter tr tribute. And then when Matt came on board, I was I was just super excited and happy and changed the character completely. But Sophia, you 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 primarily write for people. You, you cast pretty early, right? Yeah, it just helps me um, when I'm writing to to picture them and uh, especially Kirsten Dunst and Bill. Um, it always yeah motivates me and then and I feel like they keep you company while you're writing because that's always lonely and um and the heart the hardest part for me but i yeah it helps it helps to picture the, the actors for sure and it's i guess it's people you admire yeah and and if you admire someone it, it, you remain curious towards that person and it's probably someone you would want to spend your summer with yeah or winter or whatever i mean um, that was the case with all four actors and did they know, you know each other because they, they I mean of course they it seems so real their connection did they know each other or did, did you spend time rehearsing before uh, well they all know each other well hey we're only five million people in our country and <laughs> the business is pretty tiny so they know each other we did rehearse yeah uh, I always do and sometimes successfully, and sometimes it's just ridiculous and you get nothing from it. But I always try to, to figure out more or less where the character comes from, where, they, where, where they're heading, what they're hiding from the world, and what they're showing to the world, sort of the cornerstones. Mm -hmm. uh, and we improvise around that. I, I tend to improvise the scenes before or after the scenes in the script. Yeah such as if someone is proposing for a marriage, I would rehearse the scene where he's waiting in the lobby or, oh, yeah. or when he's rejected after or something, you know, unless the scene, unless I cannot figure out the scene, when I, if I have write, cry, writing crisis, yeah. like see that doesn't work, then I rehearse them to see if they can help me. <laughs> Don't you do that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We are, yeah, the things that you're stuck on, then, then you hope to have actors that are good improvisers to help get you out of a corner. But, um, but I, I agree, I like to, to rehearse the kind of back, their, their histories that they have some kind of memories. Um, do you, I love do, you the, do that every time? The re rehearsal period? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's not very long, but, but uh, if, if I can, like to spend time and with Bill, I never have because he just shows up the day, you know. Right before, but... <laughs> that was my question. I didn't, yeah. I didn't ask him. But... Yeah, no. But um, but with other things like Virgin Suicides, the the family, we all got to have time in the house we were filming in before, and they would make lunch together and spend time as the characters, which um, seemed helpful when we started filming that they had a naturalness around them. And this with with the little kids, they spent time with Rashida and Marlon. To I feel like that, yeah. But the scene, I love, like the scenes were, where they're uh, kind of partying together. Was that, was that more improvised? Because it seems so real. Um, well, like when they go buy codfish yeah. or start fishing in the harbor, it, it's like one line saying, the fish 
for right. cod fishing in stupid ways. <laughs> and then they, and then we talk about it and do it. But we had to do like a full a full week of drunk rehearsals. Oh yeah, I want to know because that's that seems like the hardest thing to do and look real. But, yeah, yeah, but that was pretty hard. I, I mean, as, yeah. as you know, Sophia, up until a certain point, it's about hiding. That you, like it with everything else yeah, we do. Right. It's like pretending that you're sober. So you right. measure your movement and and actors know how to do that. But but beyond one point one, yeah. Onwards, it becomes this tragic ballet, which very easily looks too much. And uh, we had to really work hard on that. And and drink. Uh, yeah. to, to figure it out, you know. Not when you were I, filming. They weren't really drinking. Were you drinking on set when they were filming? No, no. I didn't serve alcohol on set. But, um, well, I don't know what happened in the, with the trailers, but but, yeah, uh, yeah. but no, but I, I'm so supposing they were sober. Yeah. No, I wanted to treat them as, I wanted to treat them as professionals and ask <laughs> them to act. Yeah, it felt so real. I felt, yeah. I felt at 0.5 watching it. <laughs> <laughs> But it was a very strange creature, Sophia, because um, the script sort of had to be drunk as well. It, if you look at the movie and, and you look at the codfish scene, it's not really the same movie as, same kind of movie as when Mats is crying in the beginning. It, there, it's like a clash of genres really. And um, I love that about it because you don't know where you're going and then you're all of a sudden in a whole other atmosphere that you, don't know how you got there, you know, like life or the, like in the, it feels like you're really in the movie with them. Don't you think Elvis? Yeah. I mean, I was thinking one of my favorite scenes is because so much of mask performance is almost as if he's too much in control. He's not feeling anything and he's liberated. And that scene um, where he puts the pictures up, where he does the quiz and we know where it's leading, but the kids don't. And they're just saying what they think is the politically correct thing to say. And then the second scene in the classroom where they're like, well, yeah, I guess I drink about 55 times a week and they're not being judged for it. I mean, that, again, for me, that's what that, that thing that you do so often, Thomas, is sort of breaking that boundary between adults and teenagers or adults and kids and the way they can relate to each other in almost a really kind of childlike way that's kind of thrilling to watch. Well, yeah. thank you. Uh, well, I considered them sharks in the beginning because they're fearful of their future and when they see insecurity at the teacher in the teacher's eyes they want to kill him it's yeah. a bit like being a director i guess with <laughs> <front of actors. laughs> if, if you're not honest with your insecurities yeah but you have them you'll get killed and then they, they're on this journey together ending up in some kind of catharsis or ecstasy or beautiful catastrophe together at the end in, in the dance. But I know about the, these fearfulness. I know from my deceased daughter and I, from my other daughter that, that they're so afraid of their future and the drinking just liberates them and gives them a break from, from all these uh, huge responsibilities and they, they have in, in their lives. Gosh, Sophia, I was going to ask you about that because there's a scene early on where, where Bill and Rashida are at lunch and he starts the drinking and then he sort of basically coerces her into drinking with him. Um, and we can see her reacting to how, how basically how much control does she want to lose with him. That yeah. sort of, I, I thought about that. You can talk about that scene a little bit too because that is also about fearfulness and relinquishing control and, and being the best or worst, worst version of yourself. Yeah. Oh yeah, at the beginning I wanted him to be, that was the scene where he's seducing her and she's deciding if she's gonna, if she's gonna go there or not. But also I thought it's just ridiculous because it's, it's probably like 12 o'clock and she's gotta pick her kids up from school and, he, and she has like two martinis in front of her. So but yeah, it just, he's just living on a whole other planet without anywhere he has to go or be. But, um, but yeah, that was her kind of seeing if she's gonna slip into his world. And she's, and she's uptight and he's, He's trying to get her to live again. We have that in common because I think in Thomas's movie, it's about yeah connecting to your to the life side of you. Alcohol is a lot about connecting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's the, the doctor, the psychiatrist who who 
had this theory, which in fact, academically speaking, is not a theory, but just something he said, which I have then elevated to a theory. But um, he asked me, Thomas, how many, how many married couples do you know who met each other sober? And it, it's not that many. In my country, you know, most people are under the influence when they meet, when they hook up. I don't know how that is in America, but. And I think that's pretty universal. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful thing. No, I was uh, that because I was thinking about how we sort of realized in that couple with, with uh, Matt and his wife, how they sort of don't seem to know each other anymore. And that distance that exists between them. And there's a kind of a distance that's between all these guys, you know, it's, and it's funny the, the, and both these movies have this in common what it's like to see people in a movie drinking when, during daylight hours. There's almost a comedy in that and a, almost you embarrassed to look because seeing people drink not during daylight. Unless you're at a film festival, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> but, but you know what, what I feel very related, strongly related to in, in your movies or very inspired by in your movies, Sophia, is a super heartbreaking and delicate way of showing loneliness. There's, there's a great deal of that in your movies, which is uh, heartbreaking and which is what I tried to do, at least in the beginning of another round. I felt that these four guys should be lonely, even in the beginning of the dinner, when they sit around the table, it should feel lonely. And I feel that it's, it's been an ongoing theme in, in your movies, or at least an ongoing element. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I, yeah, I'm always, yeah, I guess I feel lonely when I'm writing because it's that time when you're, uh, you have to look inward and in life there's, you know, all the moments where you're connected and having fun, but you don't want, I don't care about writing about that because I'm comfortable, but the, the, the things I feel more interested in writing about are the more uncomfortable feelings or, you know, that when you're looking inward and um, looking at yourself and it, it just, it feels like a more solitary moment and yeah. So it's, it's that, that side, I guess, of myself. But, um, but I feel like we both have middle-aged malaise in our movies, which, <laughs> which um, or that just that kind of like, that moment of like, not, not being that excited with the day-to-day -day that you find yourself, all the responsibilities, I guess, which I felt like Mads at the beginning. And I guess Rashida's character has too, of like, not having the, the irresponsible, yeah, but, um, but Mads is so, yeah, so touching at the beginning. We feel all of their, their disconnect and then um, it's fun to see him come to life and adventure. Well, I challenged him, you know, yeah. I th and I thought I need, I need the best, best actors I can get for this because they had to sort of defend a very, you, you had to defend a very specific, emotional journey and they had to be funny and they had to uh, be touching and they had to drink in very specific and be drunk in very specific levels, scientifically specific levels. And they had to dance. How but, did they figure well, out the levels of um, their drunkenness? Well, the police has, the Danish police has, the, the Danish police force has this sort of report where, oh. where they can figure out how drunk people are from looking at their behavior. It's like at 0.7, you start singing and at 0 0.9, you get dozy. And you, at 1.1, you can't get your own clothes off and on, <laughs> you know? And we studied those very carefully and, and tried to execute it That's with so alcohol in, in the rehearsal period. That's so funny. And then is we look- Is that why you have the numbers up so often, Thomas? So we can see where they are because there's a point where he <laughs> walks into the wall with the other teachers and I think it says 1.1 just before that happens. So are you actually showing us that behavior? Right, well, I didn't follow it very precisely, but I, I tried, I, I was inspired by it. And then sometimes I took some dramatic liberties. Sometimes I found that this, the numbers were sounded too low, basically. And then I <laughs> notched it up a little bit. <laughs> I was gonna say, if I can ask you guys both something, I think that you both do that you interestingly have in common is that he really wants to get to know the people in the movies before the narrative starts. And, and that's something you both do. I mean, it, just watching again, Rashida with those generations of women, it reminded me of that funereal birthday party in Thomas, everybody's wearing black 
the only person who's really excited to be there is a waiter who's explaining all the alcohol to them. You guys both really, is this a way for us to get to know the characters or is it a way to, for the actors to find their way into it? Because it's something that you both, I can see the intersection between both of you in doing that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, lo I, lo I love that. I mean, with, with mine, I was just trying to spend enough time with Rashida's character so that you felt bored along with her in her life. So when Bill shows up, it's, um, you feel like she does. It's a, it's a breath of fresh air. She does that, that amazingly, or you, you and her does that absolutely amazingly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know about you, Sophia, but I find that the most difficult part to write the first 15 minutes where you get to know people before the ball really starts rolling. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always yeah. relieved when the story starts because I always know what moment, you're like, oh, phew, okay, now it's starting. But it's, I'm always like kind of holding my breath for that moment before. But I, I want to have it because you, you want to set it up so that when it does get going, but it's always a little bit nerve wracking. You can feel in the audience, like, when is this starting? And then there's a point where it starts, I think. Yeah, but you seem very courageous about it. You just you, you take your time and you do it and, and it, it really works. I feel less courageous. I always make too many scenes and I want to entertain people from the get go. Yeah. And, and I find it really difficult to, to, to keep cool up until that sort of 15 <laughs> oh, minutes. Thank you. No, but, I, but then it's fun to ju jump right in. I appreciate when you get us right into the story right away too. And right away you want to be with those characters. Do you write alone, Sophia, completely? Yeah, I, I, I show my brother my scripts um, when I get stuck and he, he's always there to help me, but otherwise I write alone. What about you? I'm not good at sitting. Well, I, I do write a lot alone, but there's always someone on the other end of the line. It's a bit like when I write with Tobias, who I wrote this, we were a bit like a bicycle team. Oh, right, it's you like, take over. Yeah, well, someone writes in the front without looking back, just write 10 pages and then throw it back. And then the other one catches it and rewrites. And then we, we shift back and forth, which is great. Look, that's so cool. I would love that. Yeah, that's, I think that's why my scripts, my stories seem so lonely because I'm, when I'm writing, I'm just sitting alone in my self doubt. But, but luckily my brother is always there to help me but out. How long do you, do you have sort of a, an idea about how long you take or is it, does it vary? It, it depends. This one took me a really long time. I started it years ago and I kind of put it away and then I would try to come back and finish it like that. But um, I mean, adapting is so much easier and quicker. Um, but I don't know, usually it probably takes six months or a year, but this one took me, year, like, I don't know, over five years but because I would stop and start. And I think just trying to do something personal was like, uh, it was hard to wrap my head around how to do without without being too revealing too much and um but also making it well scary in a good way again ideas is part of the uncontrollable it's uh, yeah. it's something we get you get an idea it's not yeah. something we get up in the morning and buy in a market or yeah um yeah. they come to you or they don't yeah i feel like um i was talking to my friend tamar jenkins who's a writer director we we both commiserate about how we hate writing um, and we drop our kids off at school and have coffee and talk about how hard it is to write. But um, then I think we we're saying it's like, it just sort of an idea nags at you and you just, you have to, you have to write it or else it's going to keep bugging you. And that's the point of getting it out. It's just, just that idea will stop bugging you for attention. I feel like you don't really have a choice. I think you have to, you have to see it through is my thinking. With ideas, it's a bit like, I guess, when people meet for a date, it, at least that's how I feel. I, I, it's like either something clicks and stays with you or, or it just doesn't. Yeah, it's, and it's like when, when material is sent to you, I always try to reject it, which I guess also is a method on a date. And then if it comes, it comes back to you the day after, well, there might be something to it, right? Yeah. yeah. So putting your material away can really be um, a good test. Yeah. Yeah, to see if you really care about it. Right. Often the most pitchable ideas with beginning and end and wow and a great setting and perfect gender situation or whatever just doesn't stick. And those ideas that seem really sort of vulnerable and weak um, yeah. are the ones that hang around. Yeah, maybe because you have to 
you, you have to figure them out. They're less less conceived or something. Well, as you guys are talking about this, I find myself wondering because writing is such a solitary process that when you do bring these scripts out and show them to people, I mean, what's that like for you? I mean, because you've been nurturing this thing and even Thomas, you're passing it back and forth, but still it's not been exposed yet to, to actors if you want to, to, to get involved. And that moment before you pass it off to people, what does that feel like to you? Horrible. <laughs> We're always, we're always in a situation with some verdict waiting in front of us. Oh yeah, that's the worst waiting for an actor to get back to you after reading a script, I think. Then there's the investors. Then there's uh, the first cut that someone has to see. Oh, yeah, then there's the festival who has to decide whether you're in or out. Then there, it just goes on. It's a constant thing in our lives. And uh, I find it difficult to get used to, but but it's just there. We're always being measured and it's up or down, and, you know, and then it's back to your writing process if, if it doesn't work. I have some friends from film school and, and you know, other direct Danish directors who, and we've seen each other, everything we each other have done, also all the bad stuff and all the wrong drafts. And we've seen each other really ugly and I like sharing with them because, because they're super honest and brutal. And, and I guess like you have a, a relation with your brother. There's just someone where you feel confident showing everything. Yeah, and you know that you can't bullshit them. You can't, you know, like they see through anything. But that's so nice that you have that group. Do they, do you show your rough cuts to them? And they'll- Right, right. I'll be brutally honest. Oh, I tell you, Thomas, you do as I tell, told you. They're acting like shit. You know, it's it's like uh, it's no, it's 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 very brutal, but it's yeah. very uh, it's brutal with love. Yeah, you know, I brought my dad to one of these screenings once, and he was in shock, but he was also touched by it because they're they're fully devoted, and and I am when I see their stuff. Yeah, that's so nice that you have that. No, that's I, th I find that so important, the few people you can count on for that. But do you still, um, are you still traumatized by your rough cut? Or totally, I, I'm hospitalized <laughs> from every, watching the first cut of a movie, it's I terrible. think it's the worst part of the process. Yeah. Everything is there and nothing works. Nothing works, yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's and I never, I will never learn to deal with that. There's two things I'll never learn to deal with. One thing is that the, when the family just disappears into other jobs, like the film crew, and they're like, thank you, Don, boom. And then I'm, they're on to the next. Like, Where's where everyone? And then first, first or caught zero or whatever you call it. But how do you feel about that? Oh, I always find it really traumatic. The first time was the, was the worst. <laughs> but um, I remember my first movie, my first, the, seeing the rough cut, I, I thought I let everyone down and they gave me some money to make this movie and I totally messed it up and it was really devastating. But I remember my dad telling me, your movie is never as good as your dailies and it's never as bad as your first rough cut. So I had been prepared, but it's still, it's still traumatizing. So now, now it's rough, but it's not um, as rough as that. Also because my editor, I worked with the same editor, Sarah, for so many years. She knows me so well that somehow she puts it together in a way that even though it doesn't work, it's not a movie yet, it's still, it's not as, as terrible as that early experience, but. Elvis, I don't know if you know, but it's a long row of humiliations doing yeah. what you do. It's, um, you, you meet a lot of, there's just a lot of humiliate, humiliating situations because we, we have to undress for an audience. Yeah. And sometimes they say boo. Do you work with a lot of the same crew, the, the cinematographer? I, tr I like the continuity of the crew and uh, yeah. also the cin cinematographer, but um, it's ambivalent for me because it has to do with the project. It's like, it, it's a bit like, or it's totally like casting who brings the, the right flavor to the project. Oh, I love the photography of this film. Was that someone you worked with before? Um, Stuola, uh, no, I didn't work with him before and I, I do want to work with him again. He's very, it's all handheld and he's, he's super sensitive about 
the actors in the situations. And, and he was clever about it too. And I, I really enjoyed working with him, definitely. Yeah, I love the way it looked. I love the, um, the soccer games with the kids and the way <laughs> I mean, the actor was so great, but also the way it was shot. And um, I love the way the whole thing was. The little kid spectacles. He was the only yeah. one testing higher than Matt Mikkelsen. <laughs> 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 but she was very, Matt was very annoyed by that. It's like, there's always a kid or an animal, you know. <laughs> well, you're always sticking him in animals and movies with kids and animals. You keep doing that to him. He can't win with you. <laughs> exactly. Like when we did the hunt, it was, you know, he would do his thing and he would be fantastic. And then the camera would switch around and film the girl who was amazing. And there would be applause. It was like, what is this? I'm a trained actor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, the foot of the sock. Well, the, he did, he did sort of um, he, this, the way he handled the camera here reminded me of when I did a handheld movie the first time, which was what Lars von Trier saw when we did Dogma back in the days. Oh, nice. I was at film school and handheld movies didn't exist. I don't think it was even allowed. Oh, wow. And I was I was nervous nervous about all the tracks and dollies and I didn't really know how to deal with it. So I, I found a, a DOP on my on my term who who did Tai Chi and he was a master of Tai Chi and then I thought well then he can hold the camera really still no no one will notice <laughs> and uh, everyone seemed to notice and like it. Uh, and Lars von Trier was one of them. And then that's where we started doing dog movies. But, uh, but this guy here, Stuola, he was also doing his ninja moves. So yeah. oh, that's good to have a ninja. <laughs> Did you guys all come to together to write that kind of, we always heard about like the manifesto, the dogma manifesto. Was that a group effort? Was that like a drunken night where you guys were all sitting together? <laughs> then, uh, we did a lot of drunken nights, but it, it started with Lars and me actually meeting on the stairs of this building where we both worked. And he said, so should we do this, this, this thing? And we, we sat down and it, I think it took us half an hour to do those rules because the, ba the basic principle was like, what do we normally do in a movie? And then we just prohibited that. So I, was, I would like, so what about the score? And he was like, of course, let's take it out. And, and uh, so it was quickly done. And then we became a group of more people later on. I have to say my favorite thing in, all, in, in almost any Dogma movie is the way the credits were presented. That was always the best part. <laughs> that was scary, I have to tell you. I, when I was told I was in main competition in Cannes and I was told that Scorsese was was the captain of that year. I was shivering all over and I realized we haven't done our, our title sequence. And to do a dogma title sequence was like in my daughter's uh, bathtub with some flashlights. And I was like, dude, this is never gonna work in Cell Lumière. But the- um, uh, Print them, is that, was that, I don't remember the how the titles are. Do they have to be filmed in the, you can't add- It's both and it's written. And we we I, we printed it out of the printer actually, mm. which which we allowed ourselves to do. And then we put it in a bathtub and put a flashlight on it and filmed it. And then I had one of my daughter's toys to do a lullaby, and that's what we could do. That was one of the things that I always I would look forward to any dog movies just to see how they solve the the, the problem of the credit sequence or the title sequence. I, we could do this forever, but I've got to let you guys go. Thanks so much to Thomas Winterberg and Sophia Coppola. Thank you guys. And thank you for your movies, Another Round and On the Rocks. Thanks, thank Elvis. you so much. And, um, and a trivia for you, Elvis, is that um, I wanted Thomas to be Count Person in Marie Antoinette. So he's always Count Person to me. And when I met you with your daughter, she was so, she was so cute about, he's Count Person. So you're, you're always Count Person to me. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm, I'm super proud of that. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. It was nice seeing you. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing Thank this. You.